to the World Webinar on Cataract and Refractive Surgery. More than 50 speakers from across the globe. WWCRS 2020 is the first of its kind for eight sessions in this two-day extravaganza. The entire ophthalmic community bringing together the best of the best to keep you up to date with ideas from all around the world. WWCRS 2020 Global Names Directly to Your Home starts now. Welcome to the WWCRS. Sergio and I couldn't be more happy to be presenting this world webinar to you all around the world. This past month and a half of webinars has been a culmination of sorts to lead up to this mega event. And we are more than humbled and honored to present this to each and every one of you audiences globally. We wish that you all are safe and sound in the comfort of your homes and offices, depending on time zones. We must thank each of our panelists and speakers personally to be a part of this event. A special mention to few companies and universities that have helped us gather troops to be here. Of Thalmo University, Elisa Company, Medaula, and Dr. Agarwal's Clinical Education. And the most important people of the hour, or let's say two hours, are moderators who went out of their way to get all our speakers and panelists involved in this big mega event called the World Webinar. The critical people behind this event that I must mention are Giovanni from Sergio's team, Ravi, Kumar, and Sanu from my team who have not slept many nights to bring this event to us. Just to reiterate all the proceedings, we have loads of moderation, lectures, polling, panel discussions, technology stuff to talk about. But before that, I wish to inform you all that we are an all live webinar and hence we really need and want those questions to be coming in that Q&A chat. Remember again, the Q&A button that you see below is where you want to put all your questions in because every session has a panel discussion that's meant only for the audience. Refrain from using the chat box because that just gets cluttered. Remember, there's no question that is silly and all questions want to be answered. This webinar is for you. Polling. To kickstart this event, let us now start with the first polling question and I want my audience to answer this polling question to kickstart before we move on to the first session. Can we have the polling, please? And audiences, in IOL power calculation, I get uncorrected 2020 vision in dash percentage of my patients postoperatively. Is it 50%, 70%, 85 or 95% and above? Be honest. Let's go, guys. We have 15 seconds to answer this question. And in 15 seconds, this window will close. Again, 2020 vision, postoperatively, how many percentage, how much percentage of patients get that for you guys? Can we close the polling now? And let's see the answers. Oh my God, that's beautiful. Now that's 85% people feel that they get 20-20 vision uh, postoperatively uncorrected. Let's see if our new panel and moderators and speakers can get that to 95 and above with the IOL power calculation session. So can we have the introduction video after which my moderators will completely take over the session 
Sergio and I will be in the background. IOL Power Calculation Session. The Coordinators. George Waring IV and Arthur Cummings. We welcome the guest speakers. Graham Barrett, Australia. Douglas Coke, USA. Thomas Olsen, Denmark. Giacomo Savini, Italy. Organizers. Sergio Canabrava, Brazil, and Ashvin Agarwal, India. Hi, welcome everyone. Um, Sergio and Ashwin, we're delighted to be here and we're delighted to have such an amazing faculty. Hi, George. Hi, Arthur. It's so wonderful to be here with you. And I just want to congratulate and thank uh, Ashwin and Sergio for putting together really what's a monumental task. And uh, we've got an all-star lineup for you. We're just so excited to kick it off. Arthur. So we're first going to speak about Toric RL calculation and who better than Graham Barry to share that with us. Graham, thank you so much for joining and accepting our invitation and it's up to you. Thank you. Are we good now? Great. Okay, we're off and running in the world webinar. This is great. Um, uh, I was asked to talk about IOL calculations and naturally occurring eyes. And what is a naturally occurring outlier eye? It's one that's either longer than normal, shorter than normal, has an abnormal anterior segment or an abnormal cornea. So let's start with some good news. We're doing well with long eyes. Uh, we kind of started this whole topic with our Wang Coke modification of axial length that we use with the Holiday One for those axial lengths, as you see over 26.5, and that's the formula. And we recently looked at 1,664 eyes from Warren Hill's data set that had an axial length of over 25, and we hit 93% within a half diopter. And the good news is more than that, because uh, Graham's formula is doing well with this now, and uh, the Hill second version is doing well, and Tom Olson's formula also does well. So we have lots of great options for long eyes. Short eyes, though, are still a challenge. And we published a paper in 2017 comparing the formulas that you see there with uh, the percentage within a half diopter ranging from 63 to 78%. And interestingly, the Holiday 2 and the Holiday 1 were the formulas that did best in our study. Um, and the reason, of course, in the, in the short eyes is, the, is that there's an ELP problem. Uh, you're putting a high-powered eye well in a small eye and a small shift in position has a big refractive impact, unlike the long eye where you're putting a, a low-powered eye well in the eye. Um, Warren Hill has updated the RBF to version three, and I'll be interested to see if that will do better because he's got a, a large number of small eyes in that data set. Nanophthalmus is the extreme version of the short eye, of course. Um, it also has a small anterior segment. Everything is small and abnormal, and it requires implantation of an extremely high power eye well when the formulas can, we've found can be off by five diopters or more. And, uh, very often the patient actually is less hyperopic postoperatively than you might expect due to the anterior position of the eye well in the eye. So this is a lady of patient of mine who has retinitis pigmentosa and nanophthalmus. Uh, her original surgery done in 2013, a 40 diopter lens was implanted and she ended up with a, a refractive error of about plus seven as you can see and she had a lot of posterior and peripheral anterior sneaky eye surgery was complicated. So the left eye, she comes to me with a cataract. And uh, so we decided to match the, the, the two eyes because she was happy with her glasses. And then remember that plus seven gives her some badly needed magnification due to her retinitis pigmentosa. This is her Galilei. You can see a very steep cornea. This is her biometry, axial length 15.75. Corneal thick is quite thick. The anterior chamber 1.8. Lens thickness 5.14. The mean K is 52, and the white to white is 10.7. Certainly a challenging eye for calculations. And what I've begun to realize is the key to success is less our biometry and less our formulas than the surgery. And I want to share with you the video of this surgery, a brief segment of it. I think the, the key in these eyes is to control the choroidal effusion and to do a cut down and create a scleral window right at the start of surgery so that the 
posterior pressure does not drive everything forward either uh, at the time of surgery or in the early post-operative period. I'm using a Kelly punch and it's such thick sclera, I can barely cut it with a Kelly punch. Now I'm putting Helon 5 in the eye and it's still a lot of posterior pressure. You can see the bulge of the choroid, but that was just enough uh, relief of the posterior pressure that I was able to complete the surgery well. And if we look postoperatively, these are the predictions of the formulas that we used. And at one month post-op, in fact, her refractive error was 5.75. Uh, she had a deep anterior chamber, no posterior sneaky eye. And in this particular eye, the Holiday 2 did best. But I think the point is, if you restore or maintain normal anatomy, your calculations will be better in these eyes. Keratoconus is an even bigger challenge. Uh, I want to thank Sumitra Candlewall, who uh, compiled this data set from three different sites, including ours. Um, and you can see that along the uh, x-axis axis is the uh, mean sim k. This is the y-axis is the refractive prediction error using the holiday one. And you can see as the corneal power increases, the eyes become more and more hyperopic. But in that group up to about 50 diopters, we have a pretty good R squared for this regression line. But beyond that, things fall apart as there's so much scatter in the data. And uh, the calculations really uh, show that the patients end up hyperopic, but unpredictably so. So how can we improve the, improve the outcomes? I'm thinking that perhaps ray tracing might be uh, beneficial. I know Jaime Armberry's done some work on this in keratoconus and shown some nice results. And there's a new keratoconus formula from uh, Jack Kane in Australia. It'll be interesting to test that on a data set to see how it turns out. So in conclusion, naturally out occurring outlier eyes, we're, uh, in those we're reaching a limit to our accuracy. We need to educate these patients about the limitations of our calculations. And in this group, perhaps more than any other, we're gonna need the uh, possibility of post-operative modification of eye well power, which I think will play a major role. So thank you so much again for inviting me and for the, listening to my talk. Thank you, Doug. That was fabulous. That's such a big topic and you did it so succinctly in five minutes is, is fantastic. Thank you so much. We're going to go back to Graham Barrett now and Graham's going to speak to us about the toric IL calculator. Graham, thank you. Great, Arthur. Uh, all working. So, um, I'm going to talk about uh, toric lenses. Um, these are truly one of the most important things that we have and has really made a change in, uh, in our surgery. Now to uh, utilize toric lenses, we need uh, to predict the lens, the toric lens. So we have various toric uh, calculators. In principle, it's uh, working out what the power of the cylinder is at the cornea and with vector calculations, you can work out what toric lens is required to correct the astigmatism at the cornea. Um, you can do it with a fixed LP, as was done with the original Alcon calculator. And if you look at the results, and here you see a fairly large series of about 600 eyes. Um, I'll just move out the way, but you can see that the data is shifted to against the rule. It's about almost a half up to against the rule uh, error. The centroid error is not close to zero. What about if you uh, have a calculator based on an ELP, which varies with each eye? Uh, this was suggested to be an improvement, but you can see it looks just the same. And in fact, the centroid error is all exactly the same, about half up to, so that didn't fix the problem. And it's only when you use uh, a calculator such as the AK regression or my own toric calculator, I'm not hiding yours, Doug, but uh, you can see that the centroid now is close to zero. So uh, utilizing the posterior cornea fixes that. Um, I'm looking at another presentation now. Was, is that still working? So Doug reminded us of the importance uh, of the um, posterior cornea. And there's various ways to do it by regression. Uh, my own method uses a theoretical model, which um, I developed to uh, explain the phenomenon of uh, posterior corneal astigmatism. And um, 
what's interesting though is that whether you use the toric calculator developed either based on a predicted posterior cornea or the measured posterior cornea, it recognizes that the unexpected against the rule of stigmatism, the difference between ocular and corneal astigmatism is not just due to the posterior cornea. There's other factors at place, possibly ROL tilt. And so the toric calculators, both with predicted and measured posterior cornea, uh, do account uh, for this unexplained missing piece um, and that uh, helps the accuracy. Uh, previous publications show that uh, toric calculators using the posterior cornea, such as my own, and uh, the AK regression have uh, highly predictable outcomes. When you start looking at things like uh, how the accuracy varies with toric cylinder, you can see that there are differences in the different toric calculators. And you see that as well when you look at different axial lengths. So for average axial lengths, the um, formulas, the toric calculators are very similar, but the differences become more manifest with short and long axial lengths. What's not really appreciated is that when you have a post-refractive patient, it's not adequate to use a standard toric calculator. You really need a calculator specific for post-refractive eyes. And this is available on the true K toric calculator. It has the K calculator where you can uh, use two or three different devices and get a median K, vector K, and then provide a prediction. And uh, both for sphere, but also for um, toric prediction, utilizing the measured posterior cornea uh, improves the accuracy um, for spherical calculations in post-refractive eyes, but also in toric calculations. So I guess if there's one thing I'd like you to remember from this talk is that for post-refractive eyes, a standard toric calculator, even if it incorporates the posterior cornea, is not adequate. And um, you can see on a small group of patients, 23 eyes, but when you look at the comparison, you can see that the true K with the measured posterior cornea does uh, somewhat better than the standard K. And uh, that is not my experience with normal eyes. So I'm hoping that um, utilizing uh, posterior cornea toric calculators and specifically uh, utilizing um, toric calculators designed for post refractive eyes will enhance our outcomes. That should be five minutes. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Graham. That is a beautiful presentation. I'm sure there are going to be many questions afterwards. Now it's my pleasure to introduce my good friend, Giacomo Savini. But I'd like to, he's seeing, he's looking very, very well. Giacomo has survived COVID-19 and is back working again. And Giacomo is going to speak about increasing predictability with IL calculations. Thank you, Giacomo. Just unmute, Giacomo. Right. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, here I was asked to, to talk about increasing predict predictability of IL power calculations. Uh, I I would like to go on, but there's something. All right. Well, there are three essential requirements for accurate IR power calculation. First, we need updated instruments. Second, updated formulas. And third, constant optimization. So uh, we have a lot of optical biometers, uh, more than 10 now. Uh, I don't want to talk about each of them. Uh, I just can say that there are no significant differences among the refractive outcomes based on the measurements of the optical biometers. We have shown this in different papers. Uh, as you can see from this table, more or less uh, all biometers provide measurements that give similar refractive outcomes. Here you see some results around 85% of formula of uh, eyes with a prediction error within half a diopters. And in this comparison, the Barrett formula compared to the oldest uh, was slightly better. But this is not surprising because all manufacturers follow the measurements of the original IOM master from 1999 to be able to use the ULIP constants. 
So the problem probably is more focused on which formula we have to use to get the best outcomes. Back in 2011, we had uh, only a few formulas that the, you all know, the Hagis, Hoffer Q, all the one and two and an Acer KT. Then in 2015, uh, the Barrett uh, University two and Olsen became famous uh, after some papers published their results. And now we have uh, almost 20 formulas and uh, it's getting crazy because we have more and more formulas uh, each year. So which one should we use? Well, if we st rely, still rely on old formulas, we may follow Hoffer guidelines confirmed by a big uh, paper by Aristodemo, where you can use the Hoffer Q for short eyes, the average of the three American formulas, the Holiday One, Hoffer Q, and SRKT for medium eyes, the Holiday One for medium long, and the SRKT for eyes longer than 26. The Hagis uh, uh, is valid in all groups. But now we have all these other formulas, more or less they are all available for free on the web, um, all but Naser. They are unpublished, but they are, we can easily reach them. And there have been several papers comparing them. Probably the most important up to now is the paper by Mellis, because uh, there are 13,000 eyes. And you see that uh, the Barrett and Olsen formulas here on the top got the best outcomes with the 80 and 78% of eyes with the prediction error within half a diopter. We did a, a much smaller study using the Tomei optical biometer on a smaller sample, but with the same IOL model. And uh, we got uh, even better results because you see that uh, including all form, almost all formulas, including more, uh, even the newest one, we were between 80% and 90% of eyes within a, with a prediction error within half a diopter. And more surprisingly, more old formulas had more than 50% of eyes with the prediction error within a quarter of a diopter. This is the ranking based on the prediction error within half a diopter. And you see that all these formulas are excellent. The EVO, the RBF, the Kane, Olsen, Holiday 2, T2, and Barrett. All formulas with optimized for constants are still good because you can still have 85% of eyes within a half a diopter. And if you rank formulas based on the prediction error within a quarter of, the, of diopter, the two Australian formulas seem the best with 62% of eyes. So in my opinion, top formulas in 2020 are this, the Barrett Universal 2, the Evo 2, the Kane, the Olsen, and the RBF. Uh, the main problem is that it is it's very difficult to optimize their constants without the author's support because all these formulas are unpublished. And without the constant optimization, their performance is not so superior to traditional formulas. And what about constant optimization? The constants part provided by IOL manufacturers should be used only for the first few cases, then when the post-operative refraction is unknown. Constant optimization enables us to avoid systematic errors between the predicted refraction and the post-operative refraction. As you can see from this graph on the left, the, uh, the, uh, op the, co the constants are not optimized and the mean error is here around 0.5, while when you optimize mm, the, formula, the constant, the mean prediction error becomes zero. And this is very important. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Savini. That was a, um, a, a extraordinarily high level talk that with just key pearls for all of us and um, very well done. Thank you so much. Now it's our pleasure to conclude with uh, Dr. Tom Olson from Denmark. Thomas is going to present to us about IOL power prediction for post keratorefractive eyes. Dr. Olson, thank you for being with us today. Okay. Thank you. So I'm going to talk about lens calculation in post laser bit uh, corrected eyes. And I have to take you through some of the basics before we talk about the issues with, with these uh, eyes. And as you know, the thin lens formulas work the way that you have a K reading and you have an action length, and then you have an estimated lens plane position. And this is the basic formula common to all these thin lens formulas. And then you get the IO power from that. 
in practical work, we ha have been doing like this, taking the K reading and the action length, and then we get the IO power. But behind the scenes, the formula is actually trying to guess where the lens ends up in the eye. And this is a very important step in any calculation, and it's even more important in the post laser eyes. Well, the history of formulas is actually the first formula in the world was developed by Fyodor, 1967. And he devised a method by which you could calculate the lens position as a function of the radius of the cornea. And this principle was used by the SRKT and the holiday formulas. And many formulas still use the K reading as predictive of the ELP for normal eyes. Now, the post LASIK or the post RK calculation, that's the challenge we're facing. The good news is that we do have the problem identified now. First of all, there's an abnormal Goulston ratio in these eyes. The Goulston ratio is a ratio behind between the anterior and the posterior surface of the cornea, and it's not normal in the eczema ablated eye. We also have difficulty measuring the exact central area of the cornea, whatever method we use. And then we have the wrong ELP estimation with some of the classical Finland's formulas. Here you can see the difference between a post LASIK cornea and a post RK cornea, and it does have implications for the way to correct for the cornea power. And you all know these awful uh, topographic uh, maps. You see after some high correction of the uh, cornea, and if you look at the cornea power distribution in these eyes, which one should you pick if you want to do an IL calculation? That's very really challenging. Now, forgive me for taking you back to the cornea power issue, because it's not just for the post lasik cases that we do have the cornea power issue, even in normal cases. Because what do you do if you have a K reading? You're just measuring the anterior surface of the cornea. And then you hope the posterior surface is related to the anterior surface in some constant relation. And then you get the combined power by doing paraxial ray tracing like this. And if you use the keratometer index of 1.375, you actually get a much higher value of the power than if you use the more physiological uh, index of the cornea. Now, we do have methods to measure both surfaces of the corner, and they're coming as we speak. There are different principles behind. You have the old Bukinia technique, which has been redeveloped by the Cassini. We still have a lot of shine fluke images out there, and I think that's the most popular method by now. But then we are having the OCT technique coming, and I'm expecting a lot of fun with these techniques, because not only do they give very high resolution images, you can get a lot of other interesting metrics of the anterior segment of the cornea. I've had some experience with the Pentacam, and the uh, advantage of the Pentacam is actually you can export the mapped elevation data from that instrument. That means you have the anterior surface and you have the posterior surface, and you can export these data, and you can import those data into an exact ray tracing system like the CMAX, which is an optical engineering system. And if you do that, as I did here, the corner front, the corner back, we put it on the ray tracing, and then we look for the point spread function as a function out here. You look for the minimum point spread function, that's the best focus. So you have the effective focal length of that corner, and then you can get the effective corner power of the corner as well. And it's not depending on any assumption on the shape of the corner. It's just based on the uh, 3D elevation matrix. Here you can see the comparison. If we do compare the ray trace cornea power versus the K rating, and you note that the K rating is almost one diopter too high as, we, as uh, compared with the ray trace cornea. Now, what about the ELP? For normal cases, we already know that the ELP is a major source of error in any formula, actually. And it's getting even worse if we're dealing with the post laser cases, because many formulas still use the K reading as a predictor of the ELP. I told you the Fiero approach was the original, and still have the SRKT, the Hoffa Q, and some of the newer formulas are also using the K reading as predictive of the ELP. And it's getting a problem when we talk about the post laser eyes. Now, I have devised a method to uh, predict the exact eye will position after surgery. That's not the estimated lens plane. That's the physical position of the implant after surgery. 
And we did that by measuring the exact position of the eye well after surgery. Here you can see such a scan. That's the anterior surface of the corner. That's the posterior surface. There's no doubt there's the eye well. And if you do that in a number of cases and plot the position of the eye well as the red dots in this graph, compared to the anterior capsule, that's the anterior chamber depth here, and the posterior capsule, that's the distance between the anterior and posterior surface anterior and posterior capsule, that's the length thickness. And you can see the eye well ends up in the middle of the capsule. That's no wonder because I know I put it there, but there's a mathematical representation we can use. And here you see the representation of the C content, which is the ratio of the length thickness predicting the position of the center of the eye well. So we have actually got rid of the K rating and the actual length dependence, and we have replaced the predicted of the IOL by the ACD and the length thickness, as you can see here, that's a C constant. And it's not depending on the grade K rating. That's a great advantage if we talk about the post laser cases. Now, if we don't do anything, we just do business as usual, you know you get a lot of error in these eyes. Here I have calculated what would the error be if we had an ablation of minus six. You get with the SRKT almost two diopter hypoopic error after surgery. Half of this error is due to the K rating problem, and half of this error is due to the ELP estimation problem. The solution is, of course, get the cornea right, and you should get the ELP right. So the ELP, I would say we can have an unbiased ELP prediction according to the C constant. I like to do that in post-laser cases. What about the corneal power? I like to do a tomography where I get both surfaces of the corner, and then I want to do a ray tracing. Some of the instruments actually report the ray traced corner power to you. For this session, I collected the data of 74 eyes, and you can see they had a ablation rating from minus six to minus 14. That's quite a lot in some cases. And we did LinStar, pre-op biometry, and pentagram. And here you see results. With our method, we have around 0.5 diopsis in mean absolute error in these cases, 61%, something like that, less than one, one and a half, sorry, a half diopter. It's better than the Shamus and the Heikis, and it's also somewhat better than the Portland Hill reported some years ago. So, and here you see the summary in a graphical display. If you use the Pentacam data, you actually get better results, and that was also used by the Portwin Hill. And if we use ray tracing, as I described to you, we get even better results. So the good news is we do have identified the errors with the post-LVC cases. I would say the ELP issue can be solved if you use the C constant. And I like to use full thickness corner measurements. And in these cases, they work maybe even better than in normal cases. Thank you. Very much. Remember one thing, the calculation is never a magic thing if you know what's behind the scenes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. That was brilliant and just such a wonderful way to close out our truly all-star panel. I, I'd like to thank everyone, every one of you. That was just tremendous and um, exceeded our expectations for sure. We have a, a, now a, a panel discussion opportunity where we're, we have, uh, questions pouring in from around the world. And I'm going to start with the first one um, with Doug. We had at least, uh, we have a handful of questions asking um, for definitive guidance on what is the preferred formula for short, very short, that is very short and very long eyes. Uh, Doug, um, would you mind um, coming up on your video and uh, maybe you could address that since that was uh, your uh, talk. You know, I don't, I hope you can hear me. I, I, I don't think we have the answer yet. I think we're still learning in all of the good formulas like Graham's, um, uh, Warren Hills, and so on are being modified and improved as they build their database. Uh, our study showed that the Holiday 2 actually came out slightly better than the others, but uh, I run the Barrett, the Hill RBF, and I'm looking forward to the Hill RBF 3. Um, and I'm gonna try the Kane. And uh, uh, ray tracing is, is an interesting possibility. I wonder how the C constant will work with that. Maybe Tom has an answer. Um, I don't think we have the answer and uh, we're still working on it. 
Thank you, Doug. In fact, Doug, there's another question for you, and that was specifically, what do you suggest when the case is steeper than 55 at the moment? What would you, what would you suggest? What formula? Well, if the case are steeper than 55, the first question is whether or not they're going to wear a contact lens, because if they're going to wear a contact lens, um, or if they're potentially a candidate for penetrating keratoplasty, which may often be the case, then I'd probably put a lens in that would get, make them around, put, you know, use a around 46, which would be the post, typical post keratoplasty corneal power reading. Otherwise, if they're really gonna remain wearing glasses, uh, I would aim for about minus three with a, with a K over 55. And I think that puts them in a reasonable ballpark with a huge standard deviation though. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. We have another speaker too who has asked, and I'll open this to the panel, is how do you modify the formulas when you're treating a patient with an epiretinal membrane? Anyone want to, to give an answer for that? Well, I don't want to hog the microphone, but you don't, uh, we don't modify it at all because the, uh, the, the optical biometers don't measure to the an anterior retinal surface. So uh, I don't think that you could modify it thinking that their, their, their fraction might be different, but we, we, we actually don't. Graham, can I ask you a question? Is you've got a lot of fantastic work on on toric IOLs altogether, but one question that has come up is sometimes astigmatism is not particularly a bow tie. How do you then make a decision to on tericity? Sure. Um, unfortunately, especially with low levels of astigmatism, the uh, pattern can be quite variable, Arthur. Um, and uh, not unusual to have some form of asymmetry. Um, my, my routine to make sense of those unusual corneas is the K calculator using three devices. It gives me my best shot. If you ignore it and say, well, look, this is too hard. That's a trap. You will get astigmatism. So uh, it doesn't stop me from um, doing in less than perfect conditions, I will still do a toric. I think it's better than not doing it. I mean, if you've got a totally deranged cornea, sometimes you'll throw your hands up, but that's very rare. Um, so most corneas don't have a perfect bow tie. I mean, those of us that do lots of torics will, will know that, and especially as you lower your limit of intervention for torics. Um, some sort of asymmetry, uh, non-orthogonal is not uncommon at all. It doesn't mean you can't use Torix though. Um, and I, you know, my, my method is somewhat dumb. I just do what the K calculator tells me. I've, I've been through looking at it and you know, guessing and, and fudging and it's too hard and it's too subjective. You have good days, you have bad days. I don't think that's reliable enough. Um, but I find the median K often gives me the best result. I think that's very good advice. It just makes it straightforward for everyone. And if they do find over time they're making a, a systematic con error, they can maybe modify their own, sort of the way you do with a laser nomogram. But people will be very reassured that you specifically are going with what the devices are telling you. So that's very valuable. Thomas, can I ask you a question? What do you do if you're treating tericity and you don't have the posterior case? Right, tericity. <laughs> well, um, you know, there are many formulas out there where you can actually use a nomogram or you can use your own regression method or whatever. And I have to admit that we did our own, um, let's say, regression method where we actually what's for the outcome in a number of cases without a toric implant. So you got, you got the refractive outcome in a number of cases with lenses without a toricity. And if you take these cases and you measure the anterior surface of the corner, you have the anterior case and you make the regression analysis on the refractive outcome, then you get actually what is the posterior surface of the cornea. And it, I think it's, it's very similar to the Graham method or uh, some of the other methods. So um, that's what we do actually. Uh, and we compare that with, with some of the best known formulas. And I think they work quite good. The amazing thing is 
that I would expect that exact measurements would do the job. But often you are disappointed. So when you use the Pentacam or you use any other device to get the posterior stigmatism exact, it's not always working the way that you want it to work. I, I wonder if that's just still a measurement error issue or there's more to it. Uh, I, I'm looking forward to better methods for the posterior statements, and then I think we can use measurements better than we can today. All right, fantastic. Thank you so much. We're going to have to close out. So I'm going to leave the last word to you, Joe Como, because you gave a talk on how to make it more accurate. But you want to give the last word in maybe a, a minute just on how you could summarize what you've heard so far and how we can make these IRL measurements more accurate. And to all the panelists and the speakers, thank you so much. Well, I think that uh, we need to use maybe more than one biometer to see that the measurements are accurate and similar. So we don't have differences in K and axial length. And uh, I think we need to look at what uh, is uh, available on the printout. Uh, and in this time, uh, on my machines, I'm lucky enough to have uh, the Olsen and Barrett formula to look at uh, so that I don't have to go on the website. Uh, they are automatically printed. But if I have uh, very difficult cases with uh, strange numbers, I'm not talking about keratoconus, I'm just talking about regular eyes. I also take a look at uh, Kane uh, and Eva and RBF. I think these five are the best formulas today. Thank you so much. Ashwin and Sergi, we're going to shut the session. Thanks to all the speakers. Um, a great session. Thank you.